This week on Thinking Biblically, we find out how a French-Canadian woman from Quebec City becomes a Hebrew and Semitic language expert at Denver Seminary. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. My name is Alan Gilman. Thinking Biblically is a podcast dedicated to exploring how all of Scripture speaks to all of life. And for those of you, you already, those of you that watch this regularly know that we often do this with special guests uh, as uh, we explore how their lives reflect the truth of Scripture. And uh, so before I introduce this week's guest, I want to remind everybody to, if you haven't done so already, to please subscribe. Also, please comment in the comment section, like and review and share. And so it's my uh, privilege, uh, and I'm really excited to introduce to you uh, Dr. Hélène Delaire. Uh, Hélène, uh, since 2006, has been the er Earl S. Calland Professor of Old Testament and Semitic Languages at Denver Seminary in Denver, Colorado. Last year, she became the chair of the Denver Seminary Old Testament Department. Uh, Hélène is originally from uh, Quebec City, and she's lived in Montreal and Ottawa, and um, uh, now, of course, she's in Denver, and we're going to hear how did she get from Quebec City to Denver Seminary. Uh, Hélène has extensive academic credentials, including a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of Ottawa, that's right where I am in Canada's capital. She also has a Master of Philosophy and a PhD in Hebraic and Cognate Studies from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Among her many writing accomplishments are commentaries on Joshua in the Expositor's Bible Commentary Series and Esther in the Baker Illustrated Bible Commentary Series. These and other books of hers are available on Amazon. You could look her up there. Dr. Hélène Dallaire, welcome to Thinking Biblically. Thank you. Great to be here. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to hear your, your personal story in a moment. And we were chatting. I know there's so many things that, that you could talk about. And if it works out, uh, maybe we could have you back another time to talk about your areas of interest. But if, if you were given one hour to talk about one topic to whomever, what would that be? Wow, uh, I have quite a choice here. This is a broad question. Uh, one of the area, my areas of interest has been the book of Joshua. Uh, so I love teaching the book of Joshua uh, for many reasons. First of all, it's not the first place people go to for devotionals. and. Uh, uh, many times people know very key scriptures in the book of Joshua as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord or be strong and courageous for the Lord is with you. And uh, But what happens between chapter one, chapter 24, those two verses that I just quoted, uh, is the book about genocide, is the book about violence, divine violence? Does God uh, support divine violence? Is it about military campaign report again, military campaigns in the, uh, in the life of Israel? Were the Israelites violent? And so I could easily speak for many hours on that topic. First of all, I teach an entire course uh, on uh, the book of Joshua and students have to read, do a deep reading of the book of Joshua. I also uh, did a reading in the, the Hebrew text of the book of Joshua with another class, an advanced exegesis class. And what students had to do is uh, the final exam was a play in Hebrew on the book of Joshua. Uh, they all played a part. They all had to memorize their parts. They were all engaged uh, and then we opened uh, the play to the public, uh, to most people who came were from campus or friends and family. As, and students had to be able to identify with their character. They had to be able to speak with the tone that was appropriate to what was uh, happening in the story. They had to be able to know their Hebrew text well. Those who were in the congregation who didn't, or in the audience who didn't speak Hebrew or didn't know Hebrew, we put the translation on, on the screen. So at you, least they could You see. did a live, I just kind of, 
you did a live biblical Hebrew theatrical uh, thing, really, Correct. with subtitles up on the screen. <laughs> Correct. And I did that with the Joseph narrative also with another wow. class. Well, and so I, one of my favorite was, expressions, one of my favorite yeah. expressions is uh, a truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, because there's nothing like speaking uh, the language to internalize the language and to be able to understand really what was going on in the text. Because many times we read the text and I tell students this, you know, you go from, uh, you know, you cross the Jordan and then you conquer Jericho. And then first thing you know, you're up the hill and First you get I, and then you, you, everything happens quickly. And we read it as it, it happens, it happens quickly. But the book of Joshua really covers over four decades. Mm -hmm. So there are only four major military campaigns that are, uh, that are described there. Uh, Jericho, I, Southern campaign, Northern campaign, and the rest is distribution of land and settling in the land, all this. So, so I deconstruct this idea that the book of Joshua is about genocide, violence, and we really look at the theology of the book of Joshua. We look at who Joshua with, was, his mentoring from uh, Moses. And, uh, and Joshua doesn't say very much. I mean, Moses talks a lot. And, uh, you know, how often... For someone who he, said he couldn't talk, he sure did talk a lot. He did, yeah. So how often you have, and the Lord said to Moses, and yeah. Moses said to the Lord, yeah, yeah, but you yeah. don't have that with Joshua. And so you have to yeah. go and dig and discover Joshua. Yeah. So I could easily spend an hour on, on talking about Joshua, the book of Joshua, the person of Joshua. Well, maybe maybe we could talk later about maybe you coming on and doing that, because I know it's a major issue for a lot of people, the the, the, yeah. the image, the, all the, the violence, the supposed genocide and, and all the rest. Uh, one of my favorite verses is from in Joshua, and it's it's the interaction with "Are you for us or our enemies?" With the captain, that the army, right. of the, yeah. the Lord mm -hmm. saying neither. Or it's actually "lo" in Hebrew. Just yeah, no. that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's not get too distracted by by this. Except, how many <laughs> shofars did you have blowing on the stage at once? Uh, well, at this point, only one. <laughs> only one. Oh, you gotta, you gotta rewrite, you gotta rewrite this and 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 make it bigger and and you know, I could, you know, you need at least thirty okay. shofars blowing and see if you can bring the house down. <laughs> That's right. I could invite several people to contribute. <laughs> to yeah, 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 it, yeah. Sure. yeah. Well, maybe, maybe for the movie version. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, speaking of walls, you were yeah. born in what a lot of people don't know is North America's only walled city. Ah, yeah. And if you yes. haven't been, folks, if you've never been to Quebec City, it's a it's it should be on your bucket list. It yeah. is it is such a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful town. And uh, a lot of North Americans don't know that basically North America started with uh, Samuel Champlain's uh, staying over the winter in what became Quebec City. And so talk about history. It's a it's a wonderful place to go. And it's very romantic. Um, a very romantic town. So somehow you got from that walled city to teaching on the crumbling of another walled city. And I have a feeling um, there's quite a journey between Quebec City yeah. to Jericho. So yeah, there is. Let yeah. me let me turn that over to you now, and and why don't you give as much uh, personal background as you like, and 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 okay. take it from there. Okay, I'm uh, number four of six children in a Roman Catholic family. Uh, so a few of us were born in Quebec City, one in Montreal, the others in Ottawa. And my father was working for the Canadian government. So uh, we, we moved as his work required him to move, uh, but within Canada. Uh, so I was born in Quebec and then when I was uh, five, we moved to Montreal. Uh, then we moved to Ottawa when I was 11. I found it very difficult because all my peers in Ottawa were bilingual while coming from Montreal as a Quebecoise. I didn't speak any English at all. 
Uh, so that made the teen years a bit rough and challenging because everyone was able to communicate or everyone laughed at me when I tried to speak English. So I really, um, uh, really shut down basically and wouldn't use English at all because it was traumatic <laughs> every time I did. But I learned to understand it being in a bilingual world and being in a school where they taught English. But um, so uh, when I was uh, 21, um, I went back to Quebec City for a year and met a gal there at the gym and we became friends. And uh, so I was just there for a year and she, she told me, she said, I, I was in Toronto for a few years and I met Baptist people. I'd never heard of Baptist people in my life. You know, I knew about Catholics and Protestants. What I knew is Catholics spoke French, were going to heaven. Protestants spoke English and were probably not going to heaven. Now, my view has changed since. And um, but she said she met Baptist people in Toronto and she tried to talk to me about her experience, but I couldn't really relate. So one day in Quebec City, I said, OK, come to my house. I had a Bible. She had a Bible. We opened the Bible at the kitchen table and we read John 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And we said, gee, wonder what that means, you know. OK, let's go to the gym. That was our last Bible study. So never went any further than that. But then we decided to uh, go somewhere, go travel somewhere. And we thought maybe we can uh, go to Europe and travel for a bit. But, you know, when you're 21, you don't know, you don't have the resources, you don't know the visa situations and the law. And so that wasn't going to work out. So we thought, well, let's go in the States. Well, that was the same type of thing. We'd need a visa and and we couldn't work while we were there. So we said, well, let's go as far as we can in Canada. So we decided to go to Vancouver and she was living at her parents' house at the time. And my father came from Ottawa with a truck and friends and they stored all my stuff in the truck, brought it to Ottawa, put it in my parents' garage. And my friend and I met in Toronto at the airport and flew to uh, Vancouver. Uh, we got there in the fall, 1977, and uh, it didn't take long that we ran out of money. So I took a job at a 24-hour restaurant, a steakhouse at uh, in downtown in the West End of uh, Vancouver. And at one point, you know, I didn't speak English very well at the time, but uh, I, you know, I could be a waitress. That was no problem. At one point, I was, it was, they asked me, would you work graveyard shift? And I said, sure. But I had no idea what that meant because I thought graveyard, that's a cemetery. And uh, so my English was that good. <laughs> you know. So finally, I realized what graveyard shift was. And I saw a world I was not familiar with, the world of uh, prostitutes and the world of uh, people on drugs and people who were drunk and, and a, a, an area. They all had their area in the restaurant and an area for taxi drivers and an area for police officers. And as I, um, as I served them, all of a sudden, an overwhelming love came over me to love especially those who were drunk and those who were coming out of bars and were really obviously alone and struggling. And I, I really didn't know where that came from, but I thought I'm going to be the best waitress they've ever had. So I, you know, just enjoyed what I was doing. And one night I had no one in my section about two o'clock in the morning. So I sat at the staff table and uh, the dishwasher came and sat with me. Uh, this was December 11th, 1977. Uh, and, I, and he was an introvert of introverts. So I still remember thinking, well, how am I going to make him talk? You know, what can I ask him? That's not going to be a yes or no. Or, uh, 
And so I asked him, so Joe, are you going to go to the Christmas party, the staff Christmas party next week? He said, no, I'm a Christian and I, you know, I'm not really interested in that. I said, oh, well, I'm a Christian too. He said, oh, you are? Since when? I said, well, I was born one. <laughs> you know? So it didn't take long for him to realize that I had no, no clue of what that meant or that I was not born again, that it didn't really have a relationship with the Lord. Uh, so all of a sudden, this introvert of introverts, the floodgates open, and he started sharing scripture with me and sharing the Lord. And I could feel the waves coming over me of what he was saying. And uh, then someone came in my section and I said to him, well, I have to go back to work, but I want to hear some more. Uh, and this was his last night working at the restaurant. So at seven o'clock in the morning, uh, we left the restaurant, went to Denny's, one block down the road, another 24-hour restaurant, and had breakfast together. And he just kept sharing and sharing. And he said, well, why don't you come to my church and, you know, come to the service? I said, you know, okay, but I had started going to the Catholic Church and playing flute in the French speaking Catholic Church. So I had to go home, change, take the bus, go to the Catholic Church, uh, which I did. And when I walked in the Catholic Church, the cross on the wall basically stood out. And the Lord said, It's true what Joe told you, I'm alive. And uh, I remember the emotions beginning to well up and, and uh, I couldn't wait for the end of mass to jump in a taxi and go to his church that was a Pentecostal church. I'd never heard the word Pentecostal church before, so I had no idea what I was, what I was getting myself into. <laughs> so he, um, I did that, took a taxi, went to his church, walked in and was welcomed by people worshiping with their hands up and and a great welcome from this little usher at the door who said, I'm, we're so happy that you're, you've come to the house of the Lord. And, and I thought, wow, nobody's ever said that to me in the Catholic church. Uh, and uh, and then I saw Joe, my dishwasher, and sat next to him. And as we sang the hymns and I heard the preaching, I just, uh, the Lord uh, hit me with a ton of bricks. And at the end of the service, I responded to the call. And that was uh, a Damascus Road experience for me. Uh, I, totally changed. I started pursuing every Bible study, every church activity I could find. And I just wanted to read the Bible. And I didn't know anything. I'd never read the Bible in French, so even less in English. But uh, I started meeting with my dishwasher I w uh, to, you know, read and he would answer my questions. And I remember telling him one day, oh, Joe, I read something so interesting in the book of Malachi. And, <laughs> and because I had seen years before the movie, the Valachi papers, <laughs> that's always the same spelling. So um, before, before you go on with that, do you yeah. remember what clicked in that service? You, you described walking into your Catholic church and there's this, you know, you sense the Lord saying it's all true, yeah. but to go into such a, a foreign environment like you did, and be willing to, you went forward, right? At, at some, there was some I, sort of call and you actually I got up in the, yeah. in a, among a yeah. bunch of strangers. Yes, but you know, I don't remember going forward, but Joe told me I went forward. I don't remember what happened after I sat with him and started looking at the words of the hymns and the songs we were singing. I don't remember the rest, but I know I went forward because they told me I went forward and left okay. the church after that. I don't know what happened the rest of the day. I uh, can't remember that, but I remember walking in. I remember the handshake. I remember sitting with Joe and I remember crying. I remember that the realization that Jesus was alive, even though I didn't really understand i'd never heard the term born again i mean this everything that was happening to me i i couldn't have explained it 
theologically right. or explain it because it was happening. It was right. Really so, it, so you had a would you describe an overwhelming spiritual experience? Yeah. No. Okay. No question. Yeah. Okay. So now we're after we're after this service. You're with Joe and you're doing some further study. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Continued studying, and then the 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 pastor said, and then I started being involved in the church uh, in the spring of that year. Um, uh, <laughs> it's funny because they had a a children's ministry, a bus, a Sunday school ministry that would go to UBC, University of British Columbia, to pick up kids to bring them to Sunday school. And the pastor asked me, would you like to, to be part of come with us on Saturday morning? I said, sure. I said, sure to everything. And, uh, and he said, would you like to wear the Cookie Monster outfit? I said, sure. I didn't know who Cookie Monster was. I'd never seen Sesame Street. I was raised with Bobby No and Bobby Net in French, you know, when I was young. So put this big blue outfit on and, and go and, you know, just do whatever I could do. And then the pastor said, why don't you go to Bible College, to Western Pentecostal Bible College, just outside of Vancouver. It's in, in uh, Abbotsford or just outside of Abbotsford. That sounds like he asked you the next day, you know, Cookie Monster to Bible College. Was it that quick? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost, because that was all in the spring. It was December 1977 that I became a believer. Okay. From that point on, by March, I was already Cookie Monster, and, right. and you had your you already had a degree from a, a University of Ottawa by that time. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, and um, uh, so I said when he said, "Why don't you go to Bible College?" Because people kept telling me there's a call on your life. But I didn't know what that meant because that's not lingo that you use in in Catholicism. You know, a call means you're going to be a nun or a priest. And I, you know, I was going to be neither. Uh, but people kept saying this. There's a call on your life. So I said to the pastor, uh, Okay, you know, first I said to the pastor, well, I don't know anything. He said, well, why do you think people go there? And I thought, well, that's a good point, you know. And so I ended up the following September and the church supported me to go through the program in the Bible College. And while I was doing this, I began to do my internship in the church in Vancouver. So every weekend I would come and uh, serve in the church and anything the pastor asked me to do, I said yes. And even though I felt um, insecure, ill-equipped, uh, you know, with little knowledge, I thought, well, that yeah, if he thinks I can do it, if he's asking me, if he thinks I can do it, then sure. <laughs> and, and you're still basically learning English at the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't speak English. But we went from, you didn't know what graveyard shift was. Correct. They were only months and months into it. Yeah. Yeah. Before I forget, do you have any pictures of you as Cookie Monster by any chance? Oh my goodness, I pro I don't think so. <laughs> okay, if you do, send it to me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go That's on. Funny. I would have to go in my archives, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So the things changed so drastically for me, and my friend, the friend that I went to Vancouver with, met a Muslim man and married the Muslim man and went through extremely difficult marriage for five years, very, very dark. And she was the one who had told me about the Baptist that she had met in Toronto. So now I understood what the Baptists were about. And I kept saying to her, why don't you come with me, come to church with me and and uh, come back to the Lord or come to the Lord. and. And but it, there was a real stronghold from uh, through this Muslim man, and so I just uh, went for it all the way and went to Bible college and and uh, yeah served. And I remember the first time that the pastor asked me to preach, uh, I thought, okay, uh, how? What am I going to preach on? How am I going to preach? how do you do this? You know, I don't know very little. I remember walking in the library at uh, the Bible college and 
browsing the stacks and I saw this book with all these bugs on it, you know, not real bugs, but pictures of bugs on it. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, God, everything that God created, he saw that it was good. And I thought, wow, even these things that we consider, you know, we'd crush them in the corner if we could, we'd get rid of them if we could. And that's how I felt because I didn't speak English well, because I was older than most of the students. I was 22. Most of the students were 17, 18. And um, so I was an older student at <laughs> that age. So I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to preach on Genesis one and talk about everything. Doesn't matter what you feel like. So I ended up preparing this message, preached it. And someone came to me at the end and said, do you know how many times you said, say, say, like, you know, you know, you know, he counted how many times because say is French <laughs> for, you know, and I thought, wow, I worked so hard on this message. And that's all he got out of it. You know, how many times, because you fill in the blanks with uh, expressions like this. And that's what I was doing because of my lack of English. But uh, I thought, no, okay. And eventually I uh, graduated, finished Bible college and was hired full-time as associate pastor uh, in that church. And I remember receiving anonymous letters with uh, Timothy and Corinthian scriptures underlined, you know, the one, let the woman keep silent in the church and let, let her ask her husband at home and et cetera. And I thought, Wow, how nice that they took time to write me a letter, you know, and that was the end of it. <laughs> and so I thought, if God opened this door, I'm not going to shut it. And so I just, I served in that church for five years. Then we planted several churches. We planted a church uh, in uh, southern Ontario, was in Oakville. So I joined the couple that went to plant the church in Oakville and joined them as associate pastor for five years and served in all kinds of areas. You know, as associate pastor, you do everything as, as a pastor of a small church does also just about everything. And uh, then I really sensed the Lord wanted me to go back to school for more education because I, in the pastorate, you, you help people, you counsel. And I didn't feel I was well equipped to prof or professionally equipped to do that kind of work. So in Canada at the time, there was not much that was evangelical uh, accredited academic institution. So I looked towards the States and um, I saw that Oral Roberts had uh, university had a really good or several good programs. So I enrolled in the MDiv uh, in M slash MA Christian Counseling. So I thought I'll be in Oklahoma for four years, come back to Canada and get back in the pastorate wherever the Lord leads. So that was basically my plan. So I moved to Oklahoma, which was a cultural experience for me. I had never been called honey, darling and sweetheart so much. And uh, so I... Um, I loved Oral Roberts University, loved my professors. And after my first year or during the spring semester, I saw this little ad on the board that said, study in Israel and transfer credits. And I thought, oh, I, right now I can afford it because I had sold my house in Canada to pay for my, my education. And so I thought, okay, I've never been to Israel. I had never had anything to do with the Jewish community. The, I didn't know the Messianic movement existed. Um, and, you know, for me, it was, okay, go and study there and then come back. So I went, I took intensive biblical Hebrew for six weeks at Oral Roberts University just before I went to Israel to take the course at what was then the Institute for Holy Land Studies, which is now the Jerusalem University College, uh, its course on historical geography of the land. So I went there, stayed the rest of the summer, and it completely changed my life again. One more, you know, major turn uh, in my life where the Lord used that to send me into academia. 
So I came back to Oral Roberts University and I said to my advisor, I have to go back and study in Israel. He said, okay, let's switch you to um, an MA, an academic MA in biblical literature, which I could finish that, the second year. And then I went back to Israel to uh, JUC for two years to do a master's there. And while I was there, I applied for a PhD at uh, Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, on the Cincinnati campus, which is the only place where of the four campuses, that's where they had the PhD program. Uh, uh, because Hebrew Union College has four campuses. Uh, the oldest one is Cincinnati. Then you have New York, LA, and Jerusalem have their own campuses now. And um, so after... And, and, and Hebrew Union College is a Jewish institution. Correct. It yeah. is a rabbinic seminary for the reform movement. Right. So very secular. And uh, however, you know, it's of course completely Jewish. You have the yeah. rabbinic you school. Secular, when you say secular, do you mean uh, non-religious? Liberal. Yeah. Um, non liberal, non-religious. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Cincinnati, my understanding, is the historical hub of the American reform movement. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah where it started in mid 1800s and that's where the the uh, rabbinic school hebrew union college started in the 1800s and in around 1950 they started the graduate school and opened it to christian young scholars to come and study uh, in a jewish academic environment so the point was to do studies of ancient Near East Semitic languages, uh, Jewish background, Christianity, uh, his, uh, you know, history of interpretation and uh, uh, rabbinic literature, uh, and opened it to Christians. Uh, uh, so, did that mean you were in classes with only Christians? No. So it was okay. uh, some classes, yes. All the professors were Jewish, though. They were all Reformed Jewish. And well, some were conservative, and um, but most most of them were reform. But in some of the specialized language classes, for example, Akkadian or Ugaritic or classes like this, uh, you know, you didn't have rabbinic students in the class normally. But in some Bible classes, you could be together with uh, rabbinic students. So the rabbinic program at Hebrew Union College is a five-year program. It's a cohort program. The first year students do on the Jerusalem campus. Then the other four years, they are placed either in New York, LA uh, or Cincinnati, depending on their specialization. If they want to do cantorial program, they go to New York. Education, they'd go to LA. And and rabbinic uh, congregational rabbinic work, they could go on any of the the campuses. Now, before you continue uh, along that academic route, are you able yeah. to encapsulate how Israel being in Israel impacted you? Yeah, I think having just studied biblical Hebrew. And all of a sudden being in a world where they spoke Hebrew, which of course I couldn't understand because biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew are not the same. There's a lot of overlap, but they're definitely not mutually intelligible. Um, I think that being in the world of the people whose language I had just studied and being in the location the place, the, the uh, beginning to understand the people, the topography of the land make, made a big difference on how I read the Bible after that, uh, because we traveled and we hiked and we, you know, we went from north to south in, uh, in different classes, different courses, we did uh, different things, archaeology, understanding how you actually connect what's there now with the biblical world that I uh, fell in love with, especially the Old Testament. And um, so for me, it, all of a sudden, the biblical world came to life when I was at the place where it happened. So that's why I love bringing people to Israel. Oh, and, yes. Mm -hmm. How about your relationship to Jewish people? Did you, you didn't grow up knowing Jewish people, you're, fine, you're in Israel, did you, yeah. what was that like? 
Yeah, the only thing I remember when I was young uh, of Jewish people is there was a cemetery not far from where I lived. And I remember that when they had the, that burial service that they cried so loud. And uh, but then I found out later on they're hired criers. And because one of my students in the rabbinic uh, school did her master's thesis on that. So I thought, oh, so that's what was going on. Of course, they were heartbroken and they were, you know, grieving the loss. But usually the family was uh, was in mourning at the house, but the criers were still there. That was my only uh, yeah. encounter with Judaism in my youth. No, you didn't grow up with any preconceived notions about Jewish people? It was just a non-issue? Non-issue. I didn't okay. know anything. I, you know, knowing Jesus was Jewish or being told Jesus was Jewish is not something that I'd heard. And I'm not sure I would have understood what that meant. Uh, so, but all of a sudden, you know, studying the Bible and understanding the seed of Abraham and the descendants of Abraham, and all of a sudden that the Jewish people are still alive today, the seed of Abraham is still alive today. And being in the world um, where they, they, the state of Israel, the place where thing, where the land that God gave them. And I know that in scholarship, when I wrote the first commentary on the book of Joshua, uh, I made a real point that the actual land is still the land that God gave to his people and never took away that, uh, that blessing, the promised land. And some, of course, uh, some scholars took issue with me and everything's been replaced, you know, uh, with replacement theology, even that. And so uh, I decided I'm going to make my case even stronger. And so I, I got more scriptures and even uh, other sources to really show that this is the place that God has chosen for his people. So being there changes someone's life. You know, it's not the same. After you've been in the land, you've seen, you've heard the language, you've smelled the fresh pita, you know, I've eaten the great food and stop seen it, the stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and seen the size of the cucumbers and the leeks and the, you know. Um uh yeah. And then studying in a Jewish academic environment for my PhD, I found that very humbling because I was learning from the sages, the Jewish sages. And that's how I felt during my whole PhD. And I thought, wow, the fact that they would believe in me, that I can actually do this. And so I worked hard and just wanted to soak in everything. And beginning to understand also that I was grafted in. And as a grafted in, I'm not here to take over. I'm grafted into something that already existed. And uh, so uh, I thought, how, what a privilege to be able to study in that environment. So did my PhD there. But while I was doing my doctoral work, the dean of the graduate school asked me if I would like to start teaching Hebrew in the rabbinic school and or and teaching modern Hebrew for scholarly reading in the graduate school for the PhD students, uh, because I had done quite a bit of modern Hebrew while I was in Israel. So of course I said yes, and I started teaching. And then the year before I finished my PhD, they hired me full time and they had to create a position uh, because I could not sign the statement of faith uh, as they had it for all the other tenured faculty uh, or tenure track faculty members. So they created this position, director of Hebrew language instruction. So I developed program and taught in the rabbinic school. And uh, But I was basically the only non-Jewish faculty member. And just with this, in this wonderful world of, you know, knowledge and, and, um, you know, the, the, the life that is there and, and uh, the, the courage, the, the, the chutzpah, the, all of these things together in this academic environment 
really helped me grow a lot, learn a lot. And so, so from there, I, there was a position, I found out there was a position here at Denver Seminary in Old Testament. That's now uh, almost 17 years ago. And, um, so I prayed about it and thought, well, if this is the Lord, you know, uh, for me to go back into uh, uh, evangelical setting, you know, of course, I'll, I'll do that. So prayed about it and applied and and got the job, but was extremely thankful for my experience in the rabbinic seminary and in the Jewish school and living in Israel, because all of this I brought with me in my teaching here. Uh, one thing that I tell my students is, you know, as as Christians, uh, usually Christians are afraid to ask too many questions of the scriptures, and they're afraid to ask controversial questions. They're afraid to dig too deep just in case. And so the church is, is in one sense, a bit, a bit protective of its you know, itself, don't ask too many questions. Well, in a rabbinic environment, what I had learned is the rabbis ask every possible questions and having been exposed to to midrash and to rabbinic literature of, you know, different types, I thought, no, I mean, the rabbis were not afraid to really dig deep and not everything is, you know, uh, interpretation, of course, that I would agree with, but at least they asked the questions and they didn't have to resolve everything. And because in the church, sometimes uh, if you ask questions and and people disagree, then there's tension and there's and the tension remains and then you create another denomination or you have a subgroup or and so what what I encourage my students to do is is ask questions. Don't be afraid. Dig deep, and that's one one blessing that I really uh, I'm thankful for. You've actually touched on one of my favorite subjects, and it's not an intellectual one. It's a real heart burden of mine, and this this resistance of asking questions. And I would go further. It's not just non-Jewish Christians; it's the culture. And I think it's it's one of the things that causes a lot of problems in in the Western world. This fear of asking questions, um, as opposed to the, the, the Jewish approach and, you know, growing up in a Jewish home, both me and my wife, uh, tell stories and challenge everything. Um, though there are certain, certain things our people don't want to get into that, but that's another story, but the, you know, critical thinking, questioning, and I liked the way I don't know that that's the best way to say it. I caught that you said that Christians are afraid to ask questions of the scriptures. Yeah. So that implies that this lack of acting, asking questions might even be in their personal lives. I don't know if you meant that. Yeah. No, I think what I meant is that there are inconsistencies in scripture. There's no question that there are texts that contradict each other. Yeah, at the and, very least, there's tensions. Yeah, tensions. tension. Yeah. Or, for example, if you take Samuel King's and you look at Chronicles, the parallel passage, and all of a sudden you have 20,000 people, you know, who are fighting in uh, in Samuel, in Kings, and you have 40,000 in uh, Chronicles. You think, well, what's, what's going on here? So... Sometimes Christians have a difficult time to see that the Bible is also literature and that writers have agendas and that, um, you know, the question that I deal with in the book of Joshua is why do you have these statements that they killed them all, none that was left was, uh, none that was breathing was left alive and they killed the women and the children. Well, let's, let's look at it. You know, let's not just assume, okay, you know, the bad God of the Old Testament. And uh, so, no, let's look at it. And, and many times you can clarify things. And I show them that this is typical language of ancient Near Eastern military campaign report. It doesn't reflect reality on the ground. So that 
be learning how to read scripture is scripture prescriptive or is it descriptive and both are in scripture so whatever is descriptive may fit their context that they had many wives and that they had a surrogate the slave became the surrogate and things like this that yeah it's descriptive it's not prescriptive saying to the rest of the world this is the way everybody should live yeah but you know an additional an additional problem is because for some reason in some cultures you just don't ask the questions mm -hmm. so what ends up happening is people become let's say they were brought up with this very strict supposed literal approach to scripture mm -hmm. then they go to a seminary they're introduced to scripture's narrative of of these tensions or contradictions we see in the scriptures and they're they're trained become trained in in a more literary approach and then they go so they go from committed to one camp, stuck yeah. there, and then they get convinced, now they're in the other camp, plunk, and now <laughs> it's a new dogmatic approach. You yeah. know, I have saw the light, and now this is how I'm gonna, the lens I'm gonna interpret everything. But, but it, the scriptures is a, is a such a collection of, of, of books, of writers, of viewpoints, that it really, it shouldn't even, if we take the Bible seriously, we wouldn't land in these camps because yes. the Bible itself does not reflect a camp tribal approach, right. whether it's tribal academically, tribal denominationally, it's just not there. Yeah, yeah. But, so but to, it, to stay yeah. there, we have to keep asking those questions and keep grappling with, yeah. with these, this wide variety of ways of looking at things, which is the very way that God chose to reveal himself. Yes because we have to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Those things fit within the bigger picture, the plan of redemption, you know, it, none of these things that seem maybe traumatic to us stop God's plan of redemption and nothing will ever stop the plan of redemption. And so, yes, David may have committed a grave sin here. Yes, Moses killed an Egyptian. Yes, you have, uh you know people die in war you have but it's describing what happened while god is still working his massive plan of redemption for for all of humankind so and who did he use i mean it it focuses primarily on the the, the culmination is in the messiah and you know it's not just stories for the sake of stories but it points to the messiah and then reflects back on uh, the messiah so it all goes together uh, it's about the revelation of who god is for mankind and i love that the the bible has not been sanitized i love that you have a lot of messy I situations i tell my students sometimes you know look at this dysfunctional family we were just reading part of joseph in one of my classes and I said, one day it dawned on me, my family is a biblical family. It's dysfunctional, <laughs> you know. And I thought God can handle that. And uh, because we we think we can fix everything. No, we, we have to let God fix things or take care of things while they're not fixed. Or And that's our personal lives and our bigger context in our world. And we live in a day where there's so much division as if we could control, uh, you know, what's going on. Even in our divided world of today, we need to be able to, to release what's happening in the world, not be ignorant, but release it and say, okay, God, you're bigger than all of this. You knew all of this was going to happen. You knew I was going to be living at this time. And so I always have to remind myself of the sovereignty of God, that God is bigger and that we have free will. We do all kinds of things we shouldn't be doing. And, but God can handle that. God forgives God, God, prompts us to repent i mean yom kippur tonight so um you know we have ample opportunities to come before god and say okay uh, 
uh, sorry, Lord, for trying to fix what I can't fix. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so as you're telling as you're telling your story, a uh, story which I. I was just told by um, my good friend, Alan Wiseman, that uh, you'd be good to have on the podcast. He was on several weeks ago, and we got to see him and his wife, Nahama, here in Ottawa when they were passing through. And and so they brought up your name. Um, but I I didn't know anything about you except some of the, the your list in, in academia sort of thing. Um, but what I'm really struck with is you come from a part of the country, which a lot of people don't understand, and I, and I don't mean this in any kind of disrespectful way, uh, a more provincial part of North America. And, and Quebec continues to go through a crisis, in, what I would understand, an identity crisis, trying to figure out how to be the, the Quebecois peoples, how do we assert our identity in the great sea of over 350 million English people. How do we preserve yeah. our culture? And there's just, uh, you know, middle of an election there. And uh, those of us who grew up in Montreal have lived through changing um, uh, language laws in the attempt to preserve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, so that's, that's, those are where your roots are. Mm -hmm. And then you get catapulted into into a realm so very foreign to your upbringing mm -hmm. and even then as you've encountered different things somehow you've been able to incorporate this wide variety of disparate things and have come to conclusion that even in the disparity there's truth and goodness and god yes yeah are, are, have you surprised yourself that you've been on this journey? Or is there something about your family background that set you up for it or, or, or what? You know, my parents, when I was young, my parents, of course, they all, they send us to university. They, they encouraged us to travel the world. They wanted us to be exposed to uh, other cultures, to knowledge. To, they wanted us to think uh for ourselves uh however it was in a catholic framework up to a certain point because my parents were not very religious my mother more than my father was uh, but uh but um yeah just in early 20s i remember one summer going to backpack throughout europe with a friend and my i was 22 my the brother after me was 21 he was in england for the summer to work just for fun and then when i was in germany with my friend we i phoned home and my sister came on the phone sister who was probably 24 at the at the time says hey i'm flying to france tomorrow you want to meet in paris uh, so so not being afraid to make decisions that are outside of you know um tight boundaries my parents were encouraging of that so uh, but when i look back and i see how faithful god has been in, in all the twists and turns of my life uh, and the ups and downs and often when i speak to younger generations i tell them you know when you're younger you aim for the top you know, and you think you're going to cruise up there. Nobody cruises up there. And life is full of ups and downs and challenges and obstacles. But when you look back and see how God has sustained you, Psalm 23 says he leads you through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't dump you in the valley of the shadow of death, you know. So if it's through, it means you're going, coming out at the other end. And uh, so even in the difficult times of life, to always remember that uh, I, I love the idea, I believe it's uh, Psalm um, 91 that talks about how he hems us in, how he, you know, and what do you have inside a hem? Uh, if you're inside the hem, it means that the hem is in front, behind, next to, you know, you're totally 
inside the presence of God. Basically, he never leaves us, never forsakes us. So I've gone through dark places in my life. And sometimes, especially when I was in the pastorate, there was uh, some difficult times. But but the reality that God never leaves me, never forsakes me. And now being older and looking back at God's faithfulness, and I remember uh, finding a scripture in the book of Psalms that says that he will lead until the end. He will lead until the last breath. So I think whenever that is, if it's today, so be it. If it's in 25 years, so be it. Uh, just really letting go of the control, not becoming, you know, uh, you know, space cadets, you know, uh, still uh, making uh, good decisions uh, being led by scripture and being led by the spirit of God, but, but not trying to control because there's so much in the world we can't control and in our lives we can't control, but trusting God. Have you ever struggled with the fact that you were different from the people around you? Um, well, maybe, um, different in which way do you have anything in mind? Cause, uh, well, whether it's um, speaking a different language, being up from a different culture, you know, going to, going to Israel, ending up at the Jewish seminary, uh, mm -hmm. being uh, Quebecois in Colorado, uh, <laughs> being you were uh, apparently you were director of Messianic Jewish Studies at the seminar until recently, and you yourself not Jewish. Um, have you taken all of this in stride? You know, some people can handle for a moment being feeling different from their the the group yeah. they're with. Yeah, it's. I think what helps me is always. I I have such great respect for the Messianic Jews around me, the leaders who are uh, Messianic Jews, and the Jewish community. I. For me, I find that my place as a Gentile is to really listen and watch and observe what God is doing through his people, because it's also going to impact me and impact the rest of the world, because I believe that that was the plan. And all the nations will be blessed through you. If I forget that it's about my Jewish Messiah and his people and the plan he has for his people, to bless the entire world, uh, if I forget that and become uh, arrogant or think that I'm, you know, it's about me or then it, for me, it's like replacement theology, you know, and the church has, has I think, uh, lost so much by not placing the people whom God has called at the center and watching and following and being grafted in doesn't mean that you, you know, you're grafted into something that's alive, not something that's dead. And so, so especially since I discovered Israel and uh, developed a relationship with the Jewish people, understanding uh, the plan of God through the Old Testament, um, and seeing, well, and I love when I teach in Hebrew, Genesis chapter 12, many of the translations say, the Lord said to Abraham, go to, uh, from your land, from your kindred to the place that I will show you. I will make your name great. I will make you uh, a blessing. I will, uh, whoever blesses you, I'll bless whoever curses you. When you look at it in the Hebrew, it's not. I will do this as a statement of fact. They're all the types of verbs that express desire. So it's God's heart saying, I want to make your name great. I wish my heart's desire is that all the nations of the world would be blessed through you. So that's different from the covenant in Genesis chapter 15 where you don't have any of these kinds of verbs, the volative verbs. And I did my whole di doctoral dissertation on all these verbs, the modal verbs that show desire, wish. Uh, and so, so English translations often give the idea that God says, I will do this, I will do this. What 
God said in Genesis 12 is what I want to do. And, and the next verse, Abram says, Vayelech, Avram. He went, so he went and he did exactly. He obeyed. He, he said, okay. And so when you say okay to God, what God wishes to do, God does. And so that's what happened. And it began this whole seed of Abraham and, and two pointing to the Messiah all the way until the Messiah came. So when I look at that and see that's what God wanted to do, to bless through the seed of Abraham, I cannot get away from that. I can't separate myself as a Gentile from that. So you're saying that there's, uh, in particular Hebrew verbs, there we could discover this emotive depth of desire, yeah. which is very difficult. We don't really have that in English. Correct. Um, we might make a case that English is a non-emotional language, period, oh. which would explain a lot. It also <laughs> explain a lot of the, some of the difficulties between English and French in Canada, but we may not want to go down that route because there's there's a real difference in emotion between as you yeah. as you know there uh there's a joie de vivre in, in among uh, uh french canadians that it's not always appreciated by les anglais the the english <laughs> ones um yeah. but the thing is it's it's also you know you you listen to middle eastern languages and you yeah. hear depth of desire yes and yeah. uh you know i would be very interested in exploring too like how do you express some of some of that in translation and it's actually yeah. it's a whole approach to translation is something that i've been i've been i've been working on because people when they read their english bibles or any other translation don't really understand what's going on never mind the the core thing of properly representing uh, the the original language in a target language very very difficult Correct. and, and Correct. I think even if yeah. we even if we don't know Hebrew and Greek, I think we can do better in understanding what's being expressed in the original. And I, you did such a, a wonderful job. Um, and I, I, from a little bit getting to know you in the past almost an hour, um, mm -hmm. sounds like that heart is something that God's deposited in you. Mm. And that's why I love teaching Hebrew. It's those aha moments when I see my students, uh, you know, you can't see that in English and you show them that, you know, the, the Hebrew, the, the alliteration, assonance, the word plays, the, all of these things that you can see the repetition of the root, you know, in so many different ways or the, the, and, but in English you use synonyms. So it's kind of uh, hidden. You don't see this red, the same repetition or else it wouldn't be good English, but the, the tree of life, Messianic Jewish family Bible, we worked at preserving, I was on the, the committee for uh, the editorial committee for that translation. And when we worked on Genesis chapter 12, we do not have, I will do this, I will do this. It's my heart's desire is to do this. And I wish to do this. And I wanted to preserve exactly what the Hebrew represents. And because it's such a traditional text, uh, you know, people have a difficult time sometimes changing a traditional text, mm -hmm. like try to change the Shema, for example. Um, but, but all of a sudden, when you show from the Hebrew, look at, you can feel the palpable heart of God in those volative verbs and those cohortatives that are there. And I love, and I think if that's what God wants, and if that we go with what he wants, then it's going to happen. It's going to happen his way. Mm -hmm. Well, you have certainly notched up the concept of God's will. You know, we say, if God, if God willing, I, I, wanted, I want God's will in my life. And if it sounds like we should be thinking of God's will as his deep heart's desire, yes. and then to be drawn into that, and then ref to be, to reflect it. If, if God is such a deep feeling God, then maybe we should be a far more deep feeling people. Yeah, really take time to enjoy God. I love the, the 13 attributes of God in Exodus 34. When people talk about, you know, the, the harsh God of the Old Testament, I said, well, go read this. You know, how 
he is compassionate, long suffering. He's, uh, you know, um, yeah. So revealing the heart of God through Hebrew for me is my passion. Oh, that is wonderful. Well, I hope we're going to be able to talk some more and maybe specifically we can explore some of these, these necessary gems that it very, that are more difficult to express in English that that's, that are found in the Hebrew. Um, so we, we could talk about that if, if you're interested. Um, if people want to contact you, what would be the best way to do that? Yeah, the best way is probably to send me an email at my Denver Seminary email address. If you go to the website, denverseminary.edu, and look under faculty, you'll find uh, my email address. And But uh, it is helen.dallaire at denverseminary.edu. Yeah, and I will put that so in the description so people will be able to get it there as well. And remember, you could check out uh, Ellen's uh, uh, books on Amazon, and, and hopefully we're going to have her back. Ellen, thank you so much for taking this time to, to speak with me today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, again, uh, if you want to contact Dr. Ellen Dallaire, you may do so uh, through her email address, which uh, I will list in the description. Um, and um, also, if you want to contact me, you could do so at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. Um, and you could always go to thinkingbiblically.org, the, the URL, if you want to check out uh, past podcasts. And we're also available on in audio uh, through the major podcast providers. Uh, please share this and subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's really appreciated. And so until next time, this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically.